Okay guys, I'm on the road, so you're gonna have to bear with me. What I'm gonna do is put a put links to everything that I've got um, in the description. Uh, stuff that was covered by the networks and things like that. There are, are interviews with uh, the chief of police, Art Acevedo, that'll be included in that. So, a lot of you know that when this first happened, um, I went to the house and that I had been inside the house. Now, I'm, I'm no crime scene investigator, but I know what a bullet hole looks like. I know what a bullet hole from a 5.56 five, round looks like. I know what a bullet hole from a 38 Special looks like. Um, they're, they're distinctly different. I know what an entry hole looks like. I know what an exit hole looks like. Again, they're distinctly different. Now, what HPD would have you believe in their initial announcements was that this 60-year-old man who is hard of hearing and can barely walk got off six shots, hit four separate officers, all while he was under fire. His wife walked in, began wrestling with one of the officers who was down for his weapon, and then another officer shot and killed, shot her. Um, the officer, the initial officer through the door that killed the dog was wounded and went down. They went back in to retrieve him. Now, the wife was laying on the floor next to him. They extracted the wounded officer and left her there. In fact, they left both of them in the house to die for two hours before they went in. They could easily have grabbed her and dragged her out with the wounded officer. Instead, they left her to die along with the dog. Um, this case really has upset me. Being there and seeing the crime scene, um, it, it really its made it personal to me. Um, Things that I noticed at the crime scene, the television had been muted. I unmuted the television and it was quite loud. Uh, so then I remuted it. What, what appears to have occurred to me is that they crashed the front door. Yes, they're wearing raid vests that say police across the front. But if you've got an officer with a gun held like this, that's all covered. If his hands are in front of him, all of that is covered. But Mr. Tuttle was in the rear of the house and drew his weapon and engaged that first officer after the officer murdered his dog. <clears throat> first officer gets wounded, goes down. There's an exchange of gunfire between Mr. Tuttle and the officers outside. At some point, Mrs. Tuttle comes, or, or Mrs. Nichols, uh, the wife, comes into the room. HPD says she ran to the downed officer who was on the far left of the room and attacked him trying to get his weapon and they shot her now the stupidity of that is ridiculous you don't shoot somebody when they're in that close proximity to another officer because you may hit the other officer if that occurred you're going to have at least one officer who is the victim of friendly fire there's a good chance of that what i'm putting forth is that and i've put this forth to Art Acevedo as well, that the other officers that were wounded were wounded by friendly fire. I honestly believe that based on what I observed at the house. Um, again, I'm on the road, so I can't show you any of the video from the house, uh, but I will post that uh, in a day or so. Uh, the, the bullet holes that you see on, for instance, you've seen the bullet holes on the exterior of the house to the right of the door. Those just go into a wall, the bedroom wall. That's all they do. It's, it's panic fire. And, and I'm not faulting the officers who did this because it's not uncommon when you have somebody who's never been un under fire before uh, to panic and, 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 and create friendly fire or panic gunfire. Um, sometimes there are efforts that made at doing what's called suppressive fire. It's where they fire on the target knowing they can't hit him, but they can get close to him, scare him, and make him take cover. Uh, the, you know, these, these are things that they do. I don't believe that these narcotics teams are properly trained to do entries, dynamic entries. One thing I will say before I go any further with this, Chief Acevedo is being very transparent with this. Uh, some of that has been to his detriment in that he released wrong addresses. But for the, for the most part, I like to tell you guys, I have a very high opinion of Chief Acevedo. Um, 
I think he's been good for the department. He's very popular with the patrol officers, um, and there's reasons for that. So, Internal Affairs began doing their investigation, or the District Attorney's Office began doing their investigation, and they found inconsistencies with the with Officer Goins' uh, uh, testimony. Uh, based on that, they interviewed the confidential informant that he claimed did the buy. That confidential informant said he did not do a buy. They interviewed all the rest of the confidential informants, and all of them said the same thing. They had not done any buy at the Harding Street address. Internal Affairs obtained a search warrant for that officer's cell phone and uh, vehicle. They found unlogged drugs in the vehicle, heroin specifically, some marijuana, some cocaine, and a number of undocumented firearms. Speaking of firearms, on the confiscation list, list from the house, there is no 357 Magnum revolver listed. Um, confidential informants are bad business. They are bad business. We knew this was BS from the start. You don't have a guy go knock on a stranger's door and say, Hey, I'm from the neighborhood. Can you sell me dope? I hear you sell heroin. Can you sell me some? No drug dealer is going to go for that. Um, I have spoken to the drug dealer, the guy that deals drugs to the Tuttles, or did, and he told me straight up, that couple didn't have the money to be buying drugs. They spent $15 a month to buy marijuana to treat her cancer. Miss Tuttle, uh, or Nichols, was recovering from cancer. He said, that's it. That is all. Um, these officers, these undercover officers, narcotics officers, have what are called productivity evaluations. And basically, you produce or you lose your position and you go back to patrol or to another division. Now, narcotics officers, man, they live high on the hog. They've got brand new sporty cars. They've got buy money. They make their own schedules. They have a lot of freedom. Um, they get extra incentive pays. You know, nobody wants to lose that position. And so the incentive is you make this happen, make these buys, no matter what it takes to do it, um, even if you got to fake it. Now, I'm wondering how many other cases has this officer been involved in that he faked? We, are, we know that there's at least one uh, that was a questionable situation that he got sued for. A link to that will be in the description. Um, but those other cases, HPD is looking into them. Um... The, the whole narrative is, is unraveling. And I'm thinking, my feeling, my gut feeling is that uh, old Joe Gamaldi knew that this situation was screwy from the start, which is why he made such a big ruckus. Um, I do not think that this is typical of the Houston Police Department. I don't believe this is even typical of their narcotics division. The, the officers that I know, uh, and I do know at least one officer from the narcotics division, they're professionals, and they don't cut corners. Um, I, I just think we got one bad apple who managed to stay in too long. You know, uh, the chief says there will be criminal charges. Um, my personal opinion is that the officer should be charged with murder. He, you know, his actions are, a, are directly responsible for the death of these people. And... Uh, you know, the other officers that were there. Understand, not everybody that went in under knew what was going on. No, not all of them were in the loop. They just know they're there. We have a warrant. We're going in. Um, and then when they start receiving gunfire, of course they're going to respond. But uh, I, I don't hold those guys responsible. The lieutenant over this division and uh, Officer Goings, they're responsible. They are 100% absolutely responsible. And if any of those other officers are involved and had knowledge of this, the uh, uh, the data they're recovering from the cell phones, text messages, emails, all that stuff, it'll show it. It'll show it. And uh, um, if it does, if that's if that is in case you know indeed the case, there will be repercussions. Um, Chief Acevedo, again, it's been my experience. 
Um, you know, if you have a complaint, the dude, the dude responds. He, he takes action. Um, I've caught speeding Houston police officers, notified Art, and, uh, uh, or, or better example, many of you will remember the Houston police officer I caught working an off-duty job that refused to identify himself. I sent that video to Chief Acevedo before I did anything with it. And I had that officer's information the next morning, and Internal Affairs was on the phone to me, and they, they dealt with it. It was, it was, uh, uh, it was handled more than appropriately. I don't know all the details of what went on, but I do know that he lost his extra duty permit and uh, was forced to no, he can no longer work uh, extra jobs. Uh, I don't know how long that's for, but it doesn't matter. Um, No-knock warrants are a bad thing. They're a bad thing. And most many departments are getting away from no-knock warrants, and they're going to... Uh, what they're called call and surround warrants. Basically, they'll have a SWAT team or a or a um, uh, similar type of team surround the house, and they call in and say, "Hey, come out and surrender." And the vast majority of the time, people come out and surrender. Uh, preservation of the drugs is not a problem. They already have the buys. Drugs that are in the house, they shut the water off when they get there. You can't flush everything, and you're not going to flush any guns. So. What's to be lost? No-knock warrants certainly have their place, but they should be extremely limited in how they are used. Um, again, links to everything I'm telling you in the, the press conferences and all that stuff will be in the description. Um, you guys, thanks for looking and watching what, what's going on here. Uh, it's important. This is exactly the type of situation that we need to watch out for these abuses. Because if it weren't for Chief Acevedo being so open, what would we know now? These officers would be the hero officers instead of murderers. And don't forget, they killed the dog first. That's right. They murdered that man's dog. He was defending his home against invaders. That is why we have the Second Amendment. That is why you have a, the right to be armed in your home so that you can defend it against invaders. That man thought his home was being invaded by armed thugs and he fought to the death to defend himself, his wife, his dog, and his home. That man is a veteran and he is a hero. He's the hero. Not these police officers. That man that was murdered by the Houston police officers is a hero. And Joe Gamaldi, I'm going to come up there to your office this week and I'm going to remind you. I'm going to remind you that man is the hero. I'd really like to hear you say that. But you won't because you're a coward. You're a tyrant and a coward and a little thug. But I'm going to be out front of the police officers union and you are welcome to come out and visit with me. Guys, thanks. Y'all be safe and I'll see you again soon.